everybody. Welcome to Keys to the Kingdom. I'm Marissa. I hope you guys are having a wonderful weekend. I'm so sorry we were not able to do our Shabbat video yesterday during Shabbat, but um, better late than never. And uh, we're going to continue with our Bible readings, um, our whole word study. We're going to read the entire word from beginning to end. And we're currently in the book of Exodus. Okay. And um, today we're actually going to be, um, we're going to be in Exodus 24, I'm sorry, 21 through 24. And this was right after the Torah was given at Mount Sinai. And we see um, God is giving more rulings for the children of Israel during this time. And um, <clears throat> so basically today we're going to finish um with this part of our whole word study in the book of Exodus. And then Tuesday, we will pick up again with our book of Jubilees study as well. And um, hopefully we'll just kind of stay on that circuit where on Shabbat we'll be doing our whole word study and on Tuesdays we'll be doing the book of Jubilees. If you feel led to study that book, then join us, um, join us on Tuesdays. So I hope you have your Bibles out. I'm actually gonna put up the scriptures on the on the screen here so that you can follow along with me. We're going to read together. And like I said, we're in Exodus 21 through 24. And we're going to continue reading. Um, and, and hopefully, eventually, we'll get through the whole Bible. So <clears throat> we're almost through the book of Exodus. So let's go ahead and pick up on chapter 21 here. Um, if you have your Bibles ready, just go ahead and bring those out. And we'll, um, we'll begin. Okay, so here we are in chapter 21 in the book of Exodus. Okay. And um, let's just go ahead and start here. So... Chapter 21, so like I said, this is this was right after the um, Yahuwah had given the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And now he's going to give them additional rulings to live by as, as, a, um, as a nation. And um, we're going to see some of them here in chapter 21. So let's go ahead and start. Chapter 21, it says, these are the rulings you are to present to them. Okay. If you purchase a Hebrew slave, he is to work six years, but in the seventh, he is to be given his freedom without having to pay anything. So this kind of goes along with Jubilees and the Jubilee years. Um, <clears throat> but this was one of the laws regarding a slave was to work for you for six years, but in the seventh year, you'll see that God works in cycles of seven a lot. He is to be given his freedom. If he came single, he is to leave single. But if he was married when he came, his wife is to go with him when he leaves. But if his master gave him a wife and she bore him sons or daughters, then the wife and her children will belong to her master and he will leave by himself. So <clears throat> basically, when you have a slave, if, if, if you had given the slave a wife, which is considered at this time monetary property and they have children that um, Yahuwah is basically saying that the wife and the children are going to belong to the master but he can leave by himself nevertheless if the slave declares I love my master my wife and my children so that I don't want to go free then his master is to bring him before God and there at the door or doorpost, his master is to pierce his ear with an awl, and the man will be his slave for life. So if the slave is happy and content being in the household of the, of the master with his wife and his children, then he is to bring him before God at the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear. Good morning, Christine and Crystal. So glad you guys were able to make it. Sorry about uh, yesterday, but I'm glad you guys were able to make it today. We're just going to finish up here in, uh, <clears throat> in these chapters of Exodus. 
So he's to pierce his ear, and so the piercing of the ear signifies that he is his, he's his slave for life. So he was basically um, happy and content with, um, you know, the household of his master, and now he's going to be his slave for life. If a man sells his daughter as a slave, she is not to go free like the men's slaves. So there's a little bit of difference here between a man and a woman's slave. If her master married her, but decides she no longer pleases him, then he is to allow her to be redeemed. He is not allowed to sell her to a foreign people. So you'll see that Yahuwah is keeping his people within the nation of Israel and not, as you can see here, selling them to a foreign people because he has treated her unfairly. If he has her marry his son, then he is to treat her like a daughter. If he marries another wife, he is not to reduce her food, clothing, or marital rights. And <clears throat> this is a good example of how Yahuwah in his laws and in his rulings is looking out for the interest of everybody. Okay? He's always looking out for the interest of every party involved. Okay? As if to make it fair for everyone. So you'll see if he marries another wife, he's not to reduce her food or clothing or marital rights. So she, she, he's looking out for her so that she's not losing any of her, her rights. And if he fails to provide her with these three things, she is to be given her freedom without having to pay anything. Okay? Whoever attacks a person and causes death must be put to death. And if it was not permeated, I'm sorry, if it was not premeditated by an act of God, then I will designate for you a place which he can flee. Okay, so you'll see here, this has to do with the, um, the sanctuary cities for those who unintentionally killed somebody. But if someone willfully kills another after deliberate planning, you are to take him from, even from my altar, and put him to death. So, um you know, basically kind of like the laws that we have in almost every land in the world. If you kill someone intentionally, like in first degree murder, then typically you will get the death penalty. Whoever attacks his father or mother must be put to death. <clears throat> Whoever kidnaps someone must be put to death, regardless of whether he has already sold him or the person is found still in his possession. So this is interesting. It says whoever kidnaps someone. <clears throat> so you have stolen a human being. Must be put to death. Regardless of whether he has already sold him. Or the person is still found in his possession. So um, you kidnap someone. Even though they have not been killed. Yahuwah is deeming that they be put to death. Whoever curses his father or mother must be put to death. So you'll, you'll see here a lot of these rulings and laws here um, that have to do with being put to death. You'll, you'll see throughout time that um, a, good amount of, a good amount of the time, um, even though the ruling was or the law was for them to be put to death, you'll see that they typically did not do this. Death penalty was usually a, a last resort if it did not result in the death of a human being. <clears throat> if two people fight and one hits the other with a stone or with his fist and the injured party doesn't die but is confined to his bed, then if he recovers enough to be able to walk around outside, even if with a cane, the attacker will be free of liability except to compensate him for his loss of time and take responsibility for his care until his recovery is complete. Okay, so we still have laws like this today where, you know, um, if, you, if you injure someone to the point where they have lost the ability to work or walk, um, there is compensation for, for something like this. <clears throat> um, 
If a person beats his male or female slave with a stick so severely that he dies, he is to be punished. Except that if the slave lives for a day or two, he is not to be punished, since the slave is his property. And um, <clears throat> this is this is um, this is interesting because we see here he's to be punished, but it doesn't say that he's to be put to death. So um, apparently, there were instances where you're having to um, reprimand your slave in such a way with physical force. Um, more than likely because the slave was um, uh, not obedient to the master, probably in more ways than one. If people are fighting with each other and happen to hurt a pregnant woman so badly that her unborn child dies, then even if no harm follows, no other harm follows, he must be fined. He must pay the amount set by the woman's husband and confirmed by judges. But if any harm follows, then you are to give life for life, eye for eye, and tooth for tooth, and hand for hand, and foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. So in other words, you are to pay restitution in the sense of however you wounded this human being is how, is, is how the, the judgment is to follow. If a person hits his male or female slave's eye and destroys it, he must let him go free in compensation for his eye. So if you injure your slave's eye to the point where they become blind, then you're supposed to let your slave go free in compensation for his eye. If he knocks out his male or female slave's tooth, he must let him go free in compensation for his tooth. So this is interesting. If you if basically, if you beat them in such a way that you, you destroy their eye or you knock out their tooth, you're actually supposed to let them go free in compensation for, for doing such a thing. Um, <clears throat> if an ox gores out a man or a woman to death, the ox is to be stoned and its flesh not eaten, but the owner of the ox will have no further liability. So um, it looks like in this circumstance, if an ox scores out a man or a woman to death, you kill the ox, but the owner has no further liability. However, if the ox was in the habit of gorging in the past, in other words, you were not taking it upon yourself to make sure that your ox was um, contained in such a way that, that he was no longer able to do this to people, then, and the owner was warned but did not confine it so that it ended up killing a man or a woman, then the ox is to be stoned and the owner is to be put to death. So, you know, he's making it very clear that you are responsible for your animals getting loose. You need to be responsible for how they're confined. However, a ransom may be imposed on him, and the death penalty will be commuted if he pays the amount imposed. If the ox gores a son or daughter, the same rule applies. If the ox gores a male or female slave, its owner must give their master 12 ounces of silver, and the ox is to be stoned to death. If someone removes the cover from a cistern or digs one and fails to cover it, <clears throat> and an ox or donkey falls in it, the owner of the cistern must make good the loss by compensating the animal's owner, but the dead animal will be his. So if you're being irresponsible and it causes someone else's animal to fall in because you've irresponsibly not covered up a, a water cistern. You have to understand water cisterns are, are very large and round and very deep. And they're supposed to be covered up. Um, Yahuwah deems the person who was irresponsibly not covering it to be responsible for the loss of the animal by compensating the animal's owner. 
But if one person's ox hurts another's so that it dies, they are to sell the live ox and divide the revenue for the sale. They are also to divide the dead animal. But if it is known that the ox was in the habit of gorge, uh, goring in the past and the owner did not confine it, he must pay ox for ox. But the dead animal will be his. So in other words, if your ox gores another person's ox, you're to sell the one that's living and divide the revenue. <clears throat> but if you knew that your ox had a habit of goring in the past and you did nothing to confine it, then he must pay ox for ox. If someone steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters or sells it, he is to pay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So you're going to pay five oxen over the one ox that you stole and four sheep for the sheep that you stole. Um, so in other words, in the kingdom of God, when you steal something, you're only hurting yourself because now you're going to pay um, quadruple what you were actually trying to take. Okay, so let's see here in Exodus 22. Let's continue here. If a thief caught in the act of breaking in is beaten to death, it is not murder, okay? Just like we have today. If somebody comes and breaks into your home and you beat them to death, it's not murder unless it happens after sunrise, in which case it is murder. It, unless it happens after sunrise. Hmm. After sunrise. In which case it is murder. A thief must make restitution, so if he has nothing, he himself is to be sold to make good the loss from the theft. If what he stole is found alive and in his possession, he is to make double no matter, no matter whether it is an ox, a donkey, or a sheep. I think, I'm not really sure about this part here. If he's caught in the act of breaking in and is beaten to death, it's not murder unless it happens after sunrise. It's not murder unless it happens after sunrise. So in other words, you can see them maybe. Um, maybe it, it's, it's considered, it's not considered murder if it's in the nighttime, but it is considered murder after sunrise in the daytime. I'm not sure. I'll have to look more into that, but that's, um, that's interesting. If a person causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over or let his animal loose to graze in someone else's field, he is to make restitution from the best produce of his own field and vineyard. So you see here how Yahuwah is, he's trying to take care of all the parties involved. If a fire is started and spreads to thorns so that stacked grain, standing grain, or field is destroyed, the person who lit it must make restitution. So if you start a fire and you are irresponsible and this fire gets out of control and it destroys someone's grain or field, you have to make restitution to this person for setting their field on fire. You know, it's very similar to the laws that we have here in America. You know, um, basically our constitution and our laws are based on the Torah because you're trying to be fair to all, all parties involved and you're also trying to... Um, the, the laws are, 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 are designed in such a way to, to make restitution to the party who is at loss. If a person entrusts a neighbor with money or goods and they are stolen from the trustee's house, then if the thief is found, he pays double. But if the thief is not found, then the trustee must state before God that he did not take the person's goods himself. In every case of dispute over ownership, whether of an ox, a donkey, a sheep, clothing, or any missing property, where one person says, this is mine, both parties are to come before God, and the one whom God condemns must pay the other double. If a person trusts a neighbor to look after his donkey, ox, sheep, or any animal, and it dies, is injured, or is driven away unseen, then the neighbor's oath before Yahuwah 
that he has not taken the goods will settle the matter between them. The owner is to accept it without the neighbor's making restitution. But if it was stolen from the neighbor, he must make restitution to the owner. If it was torn to pieces by an animal, the neighbor must bring it as evidence, and then he doesn't need to make good the loss. In other words, this was an accident that was out of the neighbor's control, and he doesn't need to make good the loss because this was not, um, this was not within his control. <clears throat> If someone borrows something from his neighbor and it gets injured or dies with the owner not present, he must make restitution. If the owner was present, he need not make good the loss. If the owner hired it out, the loss is covered by the hiring fee. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged to be married and sleeps with her, he must pay the bride price for her to be his wife. So. You can't, in other words, she's a virgin, and now you've made her a non-virgin. You have to make her your wife, because in these days, there, no man is going to accept her because she's no longer a virgin. So Yahuwah is, is looking after the woman here, because if he doesn't make her her wife, she will never be able to find a man to take care of her because she's no longer a virgin. But if her father refuses to give her to him, he must pay a sum equivalent to the bride price for virgins. So if the father refuses to give her to him, but this man took it upon himself to sleep with her, he must pay the bride price for his daughter. You are not to permit a sorceress to live. So anyone practicing sorcery was not, was not allowed to live. Whoever has sexual relations with an animal must be put to death. This, this definitely goes back to um, a lot of what happened with the, the Watchers and the Nephilim and why one of the reasons Yahuwah had to destroy the animals along with all of um, mankind during the flood was because they had perverted themselves with the animals as well. So you will absolutely have to be put to death if you are having sexual relations with an animal. Anyone who sacrifices to any god other than Yahuwah alone is to be completely destroyed. Okay, there's, there's no, there is no tolerance for sacrificing to other gods. You must neither wrong nor oppress a foreigner living among you, for you yourselves were foreigners in the land of Egypt. So if you have a foreigner um, living among you, you're not to wrong or oppress them. I mean, obviously they, they still have rights as well. And he's reminding them, you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. You're not to treat them like the Egyptians treated you. You are not to abuse any widow or orphan. If you do abuse them in any way and they cry to me, I will certainly heed their cry. My anger will burn and I will kill you with the sword. Your own wives will be widows and your own children will be fatherless. You know, Yahuwah has a very, um, a very big heart for the widow and the orphan. Okay, so let's just talk about the widow here. The widow no longer has her husband. So she no longer has someone covering her. So Yahuwah takes a very takes it upon himself to make sure that she is covered by him and cared for because she no longer has her husband who was her provider and protector. Um, you know, her husband did all of these things so now she's a little bit vulnerable because she doesn't have her husband. And Yahuwah makes very special, he takes very special care to make sure that we are taking care of the widow and the orphan. Because, okay, and we'll look at the orphan, obviously they don't have their parents. So again, this is their covering. This is their provider, their sustenance, their protector. And so Yahuwah steps in and he's obviously, um, you know, 
making sure that we as a community are taking care of the widow and the orphan and that nobody is abusing them <clears throat> because they don't they no longer have a covering they no longer have providers and he says, my anger will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your own wives will be widows and your own children will be fatherless. If you loan money to one of my people who is poor and you are not to, you are not to deal with him as you would a creditor, you are not to charge him interest. In other words, if anyone in the community and the nation of Israel is poor and you loan them money, Basically, you're just supposed to ask them to pay you back, but you're not supposed to charge them interest. If you take your neighbor's coat as collateral, you are to restore it to him by sundown because it is his only garment. So, <laughs> so he's saying here, your neighbor's coat as collateral, you're to restore it to him by sundown because it's his only garment. He needs it to wrap his body. What else will he have in which to sleep? Moreover, if he cries out to me, I will listen because I am compassionate. You know, during this, you know, during this time um, in history, people didn't have a whole closet full of clothes, you know. So <clears throat> it's not like, you know, this man just has all these other suits and, 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 and clothes to wear. Uh, this could very well be his only garment. This is, this is his only garment. You are not to curse God. You are not to curse a leader of your people. Um, you know, this is, this is pretty obvious. This is just inappropriate. You don't curse a leader of your own people, and you're not supposed to curse God. Um, clearly, that would be inappropriate. You are not to delay offering from your harvest of grain, olive oil, or wine. So... There are set times when you're supposed to make these offerings, and basically Yahuwah is saying that you're not supposed to delay that. Um, in other words, you're not supposed to put it off till some other time. The firstborn of your sons you are to give to me. You are to do the same with your oxen and your sheep. It is to stay with the mother seven days, and on the eighth day you are to give them to me. So what does he mean? You are to have them circumcised. Um... Well, I should say all of the sons are circumcised. Let me let me retract that statement. You're to dedicate them to him. And you're supposed to do the same with your oxen and your sheep. You are to be my specially separated people. Therefore, you are not to eat any flesh torn by wild animals in the countryside Rather, throw it out for the dogs. Um, in other words, don't eat, um, don't eat uh, roadkill. <laughs> you could say um, that Yahuwah doesn't want you eating roadkill. Um, any flesh torn by wild animals in the countryside. In other words, you're just walking along and you see an animal that has been torn apart by other animals who is like, you're my set apart people. I don't want you eating food that could possibly be contaminated. It's probably been sitting there for a while. It's going to do you more harm than good. In other words, it's not going to nourish your body. And I would rather you throw it out to the dogs. I don't want you um, eating things that are going to cause contamination uh, in your body. And pretty much all of the dietary laws um, we're just there so that it didn't contaminate your body so that you're only putting something in your body that's going to nourish it and do it well and not cause it harm okay so the dietary laws were there simply so that you didn't cause harm in your body and then sickness and disease could not have a place to um, uh, an, an environment so that sickness and disease could start to take place hello christina so glad you could join us so glad you could be here 
So yeah, this is, this is just one part of the dietary laws. We'll actually see a lot more of that when we get into the book of Leviticus. Um, and we'll actually see more laws regarding other situations in the book of Leviticus. All of the laws are, are laid out in that, in that entire book. Um, but you'll see here, um, you are my specially set apart people. He's, he's trying to, um, Yahuwah only wants to do us good, okay? And he set apart a people for himself that were willing to listen and follow his commandments. The rest of the nations were not, were not willing to do that. They were um, following their own laws and the laws of their false gods. And so um, par part of... Um, Part of the um, part of the reason that Yahuwah is instituting separation between eating certain things and not eating other things has to do with just simply keeping our bodies healthy. Okay. Okay. Let's let's go ahead and get into chapter twenty three. We have two more chapters here. Okay, chapter 23. All right, let's continue. You are not to repeat false rumors. Do not join hands with the wicked by offering perjured testimony. Do not follow the crowd when it does when, what is wrong. I mean, I'm pretty sure many of us, many people tell their children, don't follow the crowd when they're doing wrong. And don't allow the popular view to sway you into offering testimony for any cause if the effect will be to pervert justice. On the other hand, don't favor a person's lawsuit simply because he's poor. So <clears throat> this is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, don't, don't repeat, don't spread false rumors. If only the... Uh, if only the media today were following these laws. Don't join hands with the wicked by offering a perjured testimony. You know, don't follow the crowd when it does what's wrong. And don't allow the popular view to sway you into offering a testimony for any cause if the effect will be to pervert justice. And, you know, basically, Yahuwah is looking out for the poor. You're not supposed to favor a person's lawsuit simply because he's poor. What he's saying is, on the other hand, don't favor him simply because he's poor. If you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey straying, you must return it to him. So even though you may not like this person, but you see their, their ox or their donkey straying, do the right thing and return it. If you see the donkey, which belongs to someone who hates you, lying down helpless under its load, you are not to pass him by, but to go and help him free it. Okay, so, you know, love your enemies, even though, you know, even though they hate you, but you see they're having issues with their animals, you're, suppo you're supposed to do the right thing, even in that situation. Do not deny anyone justice in his lawsuit simply because he's poor. Okay, so we see here... Don't favor someone simply because he's poor and don't deny him justice in his lawsuit simply because he's poor. You know, Yahuwah is very balanced. He's, he's not looking for you to favor anyone simply based on their socioeconomic standpoint, but simply because of, you know, whatever's going on in the situation, you're supposed to exude justice based on Yahuwah's laws. Keep away from fraud and do not cause the death of the innocent and the righteous. For I will not justify the wicked. You are not to receive a bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of the righteous. If only this were true today. Um, I think everybody's pretty much accepting bribes. 
in the justice system today, I'm pretty sure a lot of that is going on. <clears throat> you are not to oppress a foreigner, for you know how a foreigner feels since you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. So this is pretty self-explanatory. Do not oppress a foreigner. Um, because you'll see also, I think it was already mentioned, that the foreigner was to have the same laws as the children of Israel. So the same laws are to be applied to the citizen as the foreigner. So therefore, do not oppress the foreigner. For in six years, you are to sow your land. So this is, this is interesting here. For in six years, you are to sow your land with seed and to gather its harvest. But in the seventh year, like I said before, he, Yahuwah works in cycles of seven. You are to let it rest. So even the land is supposed to rest in the seventh year. So let, let it rest and lie fallow so that the poor among your people can eat and what they leave, the wild animals in the countryside can eat. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Okay, so <clears throat> in the seventh year, you're to let it rest. So basically, whatever's left growing in your, in your land, you know, whatever might sprout up in the seventh year because there's some seeds there, um, it's for the poor to go and harvest whatever might be growing in your land in the seventh year, even though you did not sow those seeds. Um, you might have some stuff that's left over just growing on its own. And... Yep, yes, Crystal said, supposed to let the land rest every seven years. And another reason for that, um, another reason for letting the land rest is because, and we know more of this today as to why we should do this, is um, the actual soil needs to repopulate. Um, you let it rest and organisms sort of, when you have... Um, crops constantly growing on a piece of land, it's constantly drawing out all of the nutrients in the soil. So when you let the land rest for a year, all of those, you know, minerals and natural, you know, worms and bugs and just everything that's in the ecosystem of the soil replenishes within that year, as opposed to putting another round of crops on it to suck up all the nutrients. And this is why a lot of our food today is deficient because we do not follow these things here. In our farming, farming industry, they just plant, 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 and the soil is deficient. So now they're planting on deficient soil. So they have to use synthetic fertilizers, which further destroys the soil, actually. Um, so Yahuwah, he, he's the creator of all things and he knows how the soil works, how plants work, how our bodies work. And if we follow these laws, it's, it's only for our good. So if you let the land rest and the soil is now enriched over this last year, because you have natural compost from whatever was left over, from you know leaves and dirt and grass, and all of these things dying, then you have a natural compost that's going to further enrich the soil so that when you do plant in the eighth year, the next cycle, uh, your, your, your crops are going to do well and you're actually going to have um, this natural compost and your, your crops are going to have nutrition so that when you eat the food, it's going to have the nutrition that you need to nourish your body. So this is why we're actually supposed to let the land rest in the seventh year. <clears throat> and it's also so that the wild animals in the countryside can eat. Okay. And it says, do the same thing with your vineyard and your olive grove. So whatever you're planting, it's supposed to rest in the seventh year. So that doesn't mean that you were not planting in the seventh year. 
you would probably just be using a different plot of land and rotating them around. So you have a plot of land that you let rest, and then there's other plots of land that have already rested, and you just have a different, you just have a rotation of land that's resting and land that's not resting. For in six days you are to work, but on the seventh you are to rest, so that your ox and your donkey can rest, and your slave girl's son and your foreigner be renewed. Okay? This is why we love the weekend, so we can be renewed. <clears throat> Pay attention to everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the name. So this is, this is important here. Do not invoke the names of other gods or even let them be heard crossing your lips. Um, Yahuwah didn't even want you speaking the names of other gods. And it's interesting because um, I'm just going to pause here for a second. I think it's interesting because after the children of Israel... Okay, prior to the children of Israel going into the Babylonian exile, you did not have names of months. So it was called the first month, the second month, the third month, the fourth month, and so on. After the Babylonian exile, the children of Israel had ascribed names to the months which they had learned in Babylon. So they called it the month of Nisan or the month of Tesh... Um, you know, uh, so you had Nisan, you have, um, I'm trying, I'm, having, I'm blanking out, but there's other names of months, Nisan, Shabbat, um, I don't know why I'm blanking, but all the different months on the Hebrew calendar are actually, a lot of them are months of false gods. Those are actually um, particularly like, let's just see for example. So you have Nisan, Elul, Iyar, Kislev, Shevet, Tishrei, um, Tammuz, Tammuz is a, is a false god that was worshipped. So I think it's interesting that Judaism still keeps these names as the names of the months when it says in the Torah not to even say the names of false gods. I just think that's, um, that's interesting that they still do that. And every time I've questioned someone who is still in rabbinic Judaism, they don't have an answer for that. I say, why do you still use the names of false gods as the names of the months instead of saying instead of saying the first month and the second month when we're not supposed to invoke the name, we're not even supposed to speak the names of false gods? Of course, the answer is always, I'm not sure, I don't know. That's why I follow the Enoch calendar. <clears throat> Yeah, Crystal, um, that's that's probably the the closest um, and best calendar that I've seen so far that calculates everything correctly and um, efficiently. And uh, I don't know if the one that you're referring to is actually called the Enoch calendar because I think there's another Enoch calendar that doesn't um, account for adding the extra month so I don't even know what the name of that would be honestly the calendar that you're referring I know which calendar you're referring to I'm not even sure um, I'm not even sure what what the, the, the name of that calendar would actually be. Although it is in the book of Enoch, I think there is another calendar that people follow called the book of the Enoch calendar. And it might be a little bit different from the one you and I are, are thinking of, but 
It makes things a lot easier. Yes, that's for sure. Okay, so... Do not invoke the names of other gods and let them be heard crossing your lips. Three times a year, you are to observe a festival for me. Keep the festival of matzah. So that's Passover. For seven days, as I ordered you, you are to eat matzah at the time determined in the month of Aviv. For it is in that month that you left Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Next, the festival of harvest. The first fruits of your offerings sowed in the field. The last, the festival... And last, the festival of ingathering. So this is saying the festival of matzah, the festival of first fruits, and the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the fields the results of your efforts. So it's not saying that you're only supposed to observe three feasts out of the year. What it's saying is there's during these three feasts, is when you have um, the gathering of crops and you're supposed to bring these crops before Yahuwah. So you'll see here, no one is to appear before me empty handed. And the festival of harvest, the first fruits of your efforts sowing in the field, and the last, the festival of ingathering, this is during Sukkot, at the end of the year when you gather in from the fields as the result of your efforts, Three times a year, all your men are to appear before the Lord Yahuwah. Okay, so this was, this is when you were gathering in your crops. You are not to offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the fat of my festival to remain all night until morning. You are to bring the best first fruits of your land into the house of Yahuwah, your God. And then, of course, the all-famous the all famous law here where you are not to boil a young animal in its mother's milk. And Judaism basically says that this means you're not supposed to eat meat with dairy. However, um, I personally do not believe that this means you're not supposed to eat meat with dairy because we see... Uh, Abraham, when the three angels came to him before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he has Sarah make up, um, you know, slaughters, slaughters an animal and brings out milk to these people. So I don't think that Abraham would have been serving um, meat and dairy if this was going to be something that you're not supposed to eat together. This just simply says, don't boil a young, a young animal in its mother's milk. And it's, and it's, it's kind of funny because it's just kind of like thrown in there. Do not boil a young animal in its mother's milk. Um, but like I said, Judaism takes this to another level and says, you're not supposed to eat meat with dairy. I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you on the way and bring you to a place that I have prepared. Pay attention to him, listen to what he says, and do not rebel against him, because he will not forget, forgive any wrongdoings of yours, since my name resides in him. But if you listen to what he says and do everything I tell you, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. When my angel goes ahead of you, and brings you to the Emirai, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Canaanai, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, I will make an end of them. You are not to worship their gods, to serve them or follow their practices. Oops, sorry. Or follow their practices. Rather, you are to demolish them completely and smash their standing stones to pieces. So, as we know, these... These people groups here in the land of Canaan had very diabolical practices 
and you were not to you were not to let any of them live. His command was to completely destroy them and smash their standing stones to pieces because they were so heavily, heavily, heavily um, worshiping other gods and practicing practices that were very much like those prior to the flood. This is why they were to be completely annihilated because they were practicing just like the watchers had taught those prior to the flood. <clears throat> you are to serve Yahuwah your God and he will bless your food and your water. I will take sickness away from you and your land in your land your women will not miscarry or be barren and you will live out the full span of your years of your lives. I will send terror of me ahead of you, throwing into confusion all the peoples to whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs on you. I will send hornets ahead of you to drive out the Hivai, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, which would cause the land to become desolate and wild animals too many for you. So he's saying here, they're not going to be driven out right away because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too many for you. I will drive them out before you gradually until you have grown in number and can take possession of the land. So he's, he's showing them that he's doing things gradually for a reason so that they can grow in number and take possession of the land. I will set your boundaries from the Sea of Suf to the Sea of the Pelusim and from the desert to the Euphrates River, for I will hand the inhabitants of the land over to you and you will drive them out from before you. You are not to make a covenant with them or their gods. They are not to live in your land, otherwise they will make you sin against me by ensnaring you to serve other gods. And of course we see this becomes a big issue for the children of Israel once they are in the land. Um, this, this becomes a big issue, and they, they do start serving other gods. Okay, last chapter, chapter 24. And Moshe said, to Moshe, Yahuwah said, Come up to Yahuwah, you Aaron, Nadab, Avihu, and 70 of the leaders of Israel. Prostrate yourselves at a distance while Moshe alone approached, approaches Yahuwah. The others are not to approach, and the people are not to go up with him. Moshe came and told the people everything Yahuwah had said, including all the rulings. The people answered with one voice, we will obey every word Yahuwah has spoken. So they agreed that they would do this. Moshe wrote down all the words of Yahuwah, and he rose early in the morning, built an altar at the base of the mountain, and set upright 12 large stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent the young men of the people of Israel to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen to Yahuwah. Moshe took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud. The book of the covenant and read it aloud so that the people could hear, and they responded, everything that Yahuwah has spoken, we will do and obey. So they agreed to do everything in the book of the covenant. Moshe took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which Yahuwah has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moshe, Aaron, Nadab, Avihu, and 70 of the leaders went up and they saw the God of Israel. Okay, check this out. 70 of the leaders went up. This is an important, you'll see this number is very important, 70. Uh, throughout the word. And they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a sapphire stone, 
pavement as clear as the sky itself. There's a sea of glass under the throne of Yahuwah. And he did not reach out his hand against these notables of Israel. On the contrary, they saw God even as they were eating and drinking. <clears throat> so somehow these seven leaders, because they... Um, these sacrifices were made and these people were allowed 70 of the leaders were able to see the God of Israel and the sapphire stone and the pavement as clear sky itself under, under his feet and he did not his reach out his hand against the notables of Israel on the contrary they saw God even as they were eating and drinking Yahuwah says to Moshe, come up to me on my mountain and stay there. I will give you the stone tablets with the Torah and the mitzvot. So my commandments, my ways, and I, that I have written on them so that you can teach them. Moshe got up and also Yahushua, so this is Joshua, his assistant. And Moshe went up into the mountain of God. To the leaders, he said, stay here. For us until I come back to you. So stay here. I'm going up to talk to God. Just stay here. See Aaron and Hor are here with you. So Aaron and Hor stay behind with these with these other leaders. Are here with you. Whoever has a problem should turn to them. And Moshe went up into the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of Yahuwah stayed on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moshe out of the cloud. To the people of Israel, the glory of Yahuwah looked like a raging fire on top of the mountain. Moshe entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and he was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So um, you see this here. He was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. This is why we started our, um, our reading of the book of Jubilees at this point in our Bible reading because it's during this time that he was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights that supposedly the book of Jubilees was given to, the book, uh, was given to Moshe uh, to write everything down. Because at this point, he is in the book of Jubilees uh, giving everything that happened from the time of creation up until that point, he's re-giving Moshe the history of everything that happened. And um, so that's why we, we started the Book of Jubilees at this point, um, because it's during this time that it was actually given to, to Moshe um, while he was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So we see here that Moshe was to go up onto the mountain And with, with Joshua, it says, with Joshua, his assistant, and they went up on the mountain of God, but the leaders, the 70 leaders of Israel were to stay down there with Aaron and Hur. So if any of the people had a problem, you know, 40 days and 40 nights, that's like almost a month and a half, right? So, well, that's a month, so a month and a half. And then we're going to see what happens next week um, in chapter 25 after Moshe comes down from the mountain. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so there was there were there were some laws given here so far, and um, it's not really until we get into the book of Leviticus where you see like the whole uh, overview of all the laws of Yahuwah that are given. Um, that's mostly in the book of Leviticus. Um, some of those apply to us today. A great portion and percentage of them do not apply to us today. Um, and, and some of them simply don't apply because either you're not a man or you're not a woman or you're not a priest or you're not a, a Kohen, a, a, you know, in the Levitical priesthood. A lot of them don't apply because we don't have the temple. Um, but you'll find that there were some that were to apply 
today. I mean, we still have a lot of these laws in our laws that are in America, you know, that we use based on the Torah um, to enact judgment. You'll see them, you know, in our justice system, hopefully being um, ruled properly and righteously. <laughs> but um, we'll get into more of that when we get into the book of Leviticus. But Tuesday, come Tuesday, we will get back into the Book of Jubilees on Tuesday, and then hopefully um, next, Shabbat, next Shabbat we'll finish up in the Book of Exodus. So um, that's our goal, is to, is to get through um, the whole Bible, and we'll get there eventually. And um, like I said, if, you, if you're comfortable reading the Book of Jubilees, we'll be doing that on Tuesday. So I hope to see you then. Tuesday, I believe it should be 11 o'clock on Tuesday. So we'll, we'll pick up where we left off in the Book of Jubilees on Tuesday. So I hope to see you guys then if you're able to, if you're able to come on Tuesday. If not, I'll see you next Shabbat. And we will pick up in Exodus 25 where we left off today. And um, we'll continue our, our Exodus study. Hope to see you then. I hope you guys have a great, blessed week. And um, we'll see you on Tuesday. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.